Right, so we are going to read chapter four of Who. We're moving right through the book, and then I'll post my usual reading comprehension question. So here we go, chapter four. Roy's mother made him stay home all weekend to make sure there was no delayed reaction to the golf ball bonking. Though his head felt fine, he didn't sleep well either Saturday or Sunday night. On the way to school Monday morning, his mother asked what was bothering him. Roy said nothing, which wasn't true. He was worried about what might happen when Dana Matherson caught up with him. But Dana was nowhere to be seen at Trace Middle. Called in sick, Garrett reported. He claimed to have inside information, owing to his mother's high-ranking position as a guidance counselor. Dude, what'd you do to the poor guy? I heard there were guts all over the place. That's not true. I heard you pounded him so hard his nose got knocked up into his forehead. I heard you'll need plastic surgery to put it back where it belongs. Roy rolled his eyes. Yeah, right. Garrett made a fart noise with his teeth. Hey, everybody in school is talking about this. They're talking about you, Everhart. Great. They were standing in the hall after homeroom, waiting for the first period bell. Garrett said, now they think you're a tough guy. Who does? Why? Roy didn't want to be thought of as tough. He particularly didn't want to be thought of at all. He didn't, he just wanted to blend in quietly and not be noticed, like a bug on the riverbank. They think you're tough, Garrett went on. Nobody's ever slugged Dana Matherson before. Apparently Dana had three older brothers, none of whom who had been remembered fondly at Trace Middle. What'd you put in your apology letter? Dear Dana, I'm sorry I thumped you. Please don't break every bone in my body. Leave me at least one good arm so I can feed myself. You're so funny, Roy said dryly. The truth was, Garrett was pretty funny. What do you think that Gorilla's gonna do next time he sees you, he said to Roy. If I was you, I'd start thinking about plastic surgery myself so Dana didn't recognize me. Seriously, man. Garrett, I need a favor. What, a place to hide? Try the South Pole. The bell rang and streams of students filled the hall. Roy pulled Garrett aside. There's a tall girl with curly blonde hair. She wears glasses. Garrett looked alarmed. Don't tell me. Tell you what? You got the hots for Beatrice Leap? That's her name? Roy figured it had been at least 100 years since anyone named their daughter Beatrice. No wonder she was such a sorehead. What do you know about her? He asked Garrett. I know enough to stay out of her way. She's a major soccer jock. Garrett said, with major attitude. I can't believe you got the hots for her. I don't even know her, Roy protested. She's hacked off at me for some crazy reason, and I'm just trying to figure out why. Garrett groaned. First Dana Matherson, now Beatrice the Bear. You got a death wish, Tex? Tell me your story. What's her story? Not now. We're going to be late for class. Come on, Roy said, please. Garrett stepped closer, checking nervously over his shoulder. Here's one thing you need to know about Beatrice Leap, he said in a whisper. Last year, one of the star linebackers for Graham High School stuck up behind her and slapped her on the bottom. This was at the big Cypress Mall, broad daylight. Beatrice chased the guy down and heaved him into a fountain, broke his collarbone in three places, out for the season. No way, said Roy. Maybe you ought to think about Catholic school. Roy gave a hollow laugh. Too bad we're Methodists. Then convert, dude, Garrett said. Seriously. Officer David Delenko looked forward to getting up early to scout the construction site. It was a welcome break from his daily routine, which offered new opportunities for real surveillance. Usually that was left to the detectives. Although Officer Delenko liked the town of Coconut Cove, he had become bored with his job, which mostly involved traffic enforcement. He had joined the public force because he wanted to solve crimes and arrest criminals. Yet, except for the occasional drunk driver, Officer Delenko barely got to lock anybody up. The handcuffs clipped to his belt were as shiny and unscratched as they were the day he joined the force, almost two years earlier. Vandalism and trespassing weren't big-time crimes, but Officer Delinko was intrigued by the continuing pattern of mischief at the future site of Mother, pa Mother Paula's All-American Pancake House. He had a hunch that the culprit, or culprits, intend intended something much more serious than juvenile pranks. Since the police chief was getting more pressure to stop the incidents, Officer Delinko knew that catching the vandals would be a feather in his cap, and possibly the first step towards a promotion. His long-term career goal was to become a detective, and the Mother Paula case had the chance to show off that he had the right stuff. On the first Monday after the alligator episode, Officer Delinko set his alarm for 5 a.m. He rolled out of bed, took a quick shower, toasted himself a bagel, and headed for the construction site. It was still dark when he arrived. Three times he circled the block and saw nothing, except for a garbage truck, the streets were empty. The police radio was quiet as well. Not much happened in Coconut Grove before dawn, or after dawn for that matter, Delinko mused. 
He parked the squad car next to Leroy's Brandit's work trailer and waited for the sun to rise. It promised to be a pretty morning. The sky looked clear with a rim of pink in the east. Officer Jelenko wished that he'd brought a thermos of coffee because he wasn't accustomed to getting up so early. Once he caught himself sagging behind the steering wheel, so he slapped himself briskly in the cheeks in order to stay awake. Peering through the, fizz the fuzzy early morning gray, Officer Delenko thought he had um, thought he saw movement in the open field ahead of him. He flicked the squad car's headlights, and there, and on a grassy mound marked up by a flesh freshly planted survey stake, stood a pair of burrowing owls. Curly hadn't been kidding. They were the dinkiest owls that Officer Delenko had ever seen only eight or nine inches tall. They were dark brown with spotted wings, whitish throats, and piercing amber eyes. Officer Delenko wasn't a bird watcher, but he was intrigued by the toy-sized owls. For several moments, they stared at the car, their eyes blinking uncertainly. Then they took off, swooping low over the scrub. Hoping he hadn't scared the birds away from their nest, Officer Delenko turned off his headlights. He rubbed his heavy eyelids and propped his head against the inside of the car window. The glass felt cool against his skin. A mosquito buzzed around his nose, but he was too sleepy to swipe at it. Soon he nodded off, and the next thing he heard was the radio crackle of a disp dispatcher's voice routinely asking for his location. Officer Delinko fumbled with the microphone and recited the address of the construction site. 10-4, the dispatcher said, signing off. Officer Delinko gradually roused himself. The squad car was hot, but oddly it looked darker outside now than when he'd first arrived. So dark, in fact, that he couldn't see anything, not even the construction trailer. In a fleeting moment of dread, Officer Delinko wondered if he had actually, it was actually already the next night. Was it impossible that he'd accidentally slept through the whole day? Just then, something smacked against the squad car. Pow! Then came another smack. Then another one after that. A steady, invisible pounding. Officer Delinko grabbed for his gun, but it wouldn't come out of his holster. The seatbelt was in the way. As he struggled to unstrap himself, the car door flew open and a white blast of sunlight hit him in the face. He shielded his eyes in remembering what they taught him in the academy, and he started shouting, Police officer! Police officer! Yeah, you could have fooled me. It was Curly, the sullen construction foreman. What's the matter? You didn't hear me knocking? Officer Delinko tried to gather his senses. Guess I fell asleep. Did something happen? Curly sighed. See for yourself. The patrolman emerged into a glaring daylight. Oh no, he muttered. Oh yeah, Curly said. While Officer Delinko had been dozing, somebody had sprayed the windows of his squad car with black paint. What time is it? He asked Curly. 9.30. Officer, Officer Delinko let out an involuntary wh whimper. 9.30. He touched his fingers to the windshield. The paint was dry. My car, he said despondently. Your car? Curly bent down and scooped up an armful of dug up survey stakes. Who cares about your stupid car? He said. Roy spent the morning with a knot in his stomach. Something had to be done, something decisive. He couldn't spend the rest of his year hiding from Dana Matherson and Beatrice Sleep. Dana could be dealt with later, but Beatrice the bear couldn't wait. At lunchtime, Roy spotted her across the cafeteria. She was sitting with three other girls from the soccer team. They looked lanky and tough, but not as formidable as Beatrice. Taking a deep breath, Roy walked over and sat at the same table. Beatrice glared in seething disbelief while her friends regarded him with amusement and kept eating. What's your problem? Beatrice demanded. In one hand was a barbecue pork sandwich suspended between the tray and her sneering mouth. I think you're the one with the problem, Roy smiled, even though he was nervous. Beatrice's soccer friends were impressed. They set down their forks and waited to see what was coming next. Roy plowed ahead. Beatrice, he said. I've got no idea why you're mad about what happened on the bus. You're not the one who got choked, and you're not the one who got punched in the nose. So I'm only going to say this once. If I did something to upset you, I'm sorry, and it wasn't on purpose. Evidently, no one had ever spoken to Beatrice so forthright, and so she appeared to be in a state of shock. Her sandwich remained fixed in midair, the barbecue sauce trickling down her fingers. How much do you weigh? Roy asked, not unpleasantly. What? Beatrice stammered. Well, I weigh exactly 94 pounds, and I bet you're at least 105. One of Beatrice's friends giggled, and Beatrice shot a scowl, which means you could probably knock me around the cafeteria all day, but it wouldn't prove a darn thing, Roy said. Next time you've got a problem, just tell me, and we'll sit down and talk about it like civilized human beings, okay? Civilized, Beatrice repeated, gazing at Roy over the rims of her glasses. Roy's eyes flickered to her hand, which was now dripping with fat globs of barbecue sauce. Soggy chunks of bun and meat were visible between clenched fingers. She had squeezed the sandwich so ferociously that it had disintegrated. 
One of the soccer girls leaned close to Roy. Listen, Mouth, you best get out of here while you can. This is so not cool. Roy stood up calmly. Beatrice, are we straight on this? If anything's bothering you now, now's the time to tell me. Beatrice the bear dropped the remains of her sandwich on the plate and wiped her hands with a wad of paper towels. She didn't say a word. Whatever, Roy made a point of smiling again. I'm glad we had this chance to get to know each other a little. Then he walked to the other side of the cafeteria and sat down alone to eat his lunch. Garrett snuck into his mother's office and copied the address of the master enrollment sheet. It cost Roy a buck. Roy handed the piece of paper to his mother as they were riding in the car. I need to stop here, he told her. Mrs. Eberhardt glanced at the piece of paper. All right, Roy, it's on our way. She assumed the address belonged to one of Roy's friends and that he was picking up a textbook or homework or something. As they pulled into the driveway of the house, Roy said, this will only take a minute. I'll be right back. Dana Matherson's mother answered the door. She looked a lot like her son, which was unfortunate. Dana home, Roy asked. Who are you? I go to school with him. Mrs. Matherson grunted, turned around, and yelled Dana's name. Roy was glad that she didn't invite him inside. Soon she heard heavy footsteps, and Dana himself filled the doorway. He wore long blue pajamas that could have fit a polar bear. A mound of thick gauze crossed by shiny white tape occupied the center of his piggish face. Both eyes were badly swollen and ringed with purple bruising. Roy stood speechless. It was hard to believe that one punch had done so much damage. Roy glared down at him and pin in a pinched nasal voice said, I'm not believing this. Don't worry, I just came to give you something. Roy handed him the envelope containing the apology letter. What is it? Dana asked suspiciously. Go ahead and open it. Dana's mother appeared behind him. Who is he? She asked Dana, and what does he want? Never mind, Dana mumbled. Roy piped up. I'm not the one your son tried to strangle the other day. I'm the one who slugged him. Dana's shoulders stiffened. His mother clucked in amusement. You've got to be kidding me. This twerp is the one that messed up your face? I came to apologize. It's all in the letter, Roy pointed at the envelope clutched in Dana's right hand. Let me see, Miss Matherson reached over her son's shoulder, but he pulled it away and crumpled the envelope in his fist. Get lost, cowgirl, he snarled at Roy. Me and you will settle this when I get back to school. When Roy returned to this car, his mother asked, why are those two people wrestling on the porch? The one in the pajamas is the kid who tried to choke me on the bus. The other one, that's his mother. They're fighting over my apology letter. Oh, Miss Eberhardt thoughtfully watched the strange scene through her car window. I hope they don't hurt each other. They're both rather husky, aren't they? Yes, they are, Mom. Can we go home now? So that was the end of chapter four. Let me pull up my reading comprehension questions. So chapter four questions. One, what did the vandals do to Officer Delinko's car? This is when he fell asleep. And two, what is Beatrice's nickname? Is it A, Beatrice the dog, B, Beatrice the bear, or C, Beatrice the bat? All right, so pause this video right now and give your student a chance to answer the questions. I appreciate you watching today, and I look forward to reading to you again tomorrow.